7 p.m. on Interstate 25. Headlights punch holes through the night, and a car travels north towards Wyoming. Behind the wheel, 18-year-old Lisa Marie Kimmel presses her foot to the floor, and her black sports car accelerates, carrying her deeper into the gathering darkness. It's two o'clock in the afternoon when Ron and Sheila Kimmel walk into their home. A light on the answering machine flickers. Sheila presses play and listens. It's Ed Girac, Lisa Kimmel's boyfriend. We received a number of phone calls letting us know that um, Ed was trying to reach us and that she had not made it to his, his place that evening. And that's when we realized that something was desperately wrong. Ed Girac tells Lisa's parents their daughter never showed up at his home in Cody, Wyoming, and never called. Family and friends hit the interstate, retracing the route Lisa would have taken, looking for any sign of her or her car. A two-door black Honda with the license plate, Lil Miss. After the first day of searching, road searches and airplane searches, retracing her intended route, did not produce a car maybe off on the side of the road or um, down an embankment. The next morning, Lisa's father files a missing persons report. At 2 p.m., a fisherman strolls along the riverbank after a successful catch and glances into the water. In the middle of the river bend floats a body. Investigator Dan Tholson watches as a woman, partially naked, is pulled from the water. Typically, if you find a female that's been murdered alongside the, the road or in the river or something like that, there's been a sexual assault. So we were thinking that, but really didn't know for sure. Tholson and his partner, Jim Bros speculate the victim was thrown from the bridge less than a mile away. The investigators work the bridge's surface and give this theory some traction. There was an area on the bridge, probably 12 inches by 18 inches, where there was a, a, a large puddle of blood. And then you could see where blood spatters were on the, the concrete abutment that came up from the surface of the bridge. The blood is collected and tagged. Meanwhile, Jane Doe's body is zipped into a bag and transported to a local funeral home for an official autopsy. Under the cold glare of the coroner's lights, the autopsy begins. Dr. James Thorpin compares dental x-rays from the corpse to current missing persons cases in the area. Lisa Marie Kimmel's x-rays are the first Thorpin pulls and a perfect match. The woman taken from the North Platte River is the missing 18-year-old. The question now, how did she get there? At the time, we had Lisa, but we didn't have a murder weapon. We didn't have her car. She was found partially clad, so most of her clothes are missing. And this car is a link. This car is very important to get back. With few investigative cards to play, Natrona County reviews a report generated by profilers at the FBI, hoping that their expertise can breathe life into a stalled investigation. The resulting report points detectives in the direction of a white male, 20s to 30s, most likely still residing in the Casper area. They also specifically described the person as being kind of a lone wolf type person who would prefer to be alone. And they thought probably that he had come into contact with her, you know, at maybe a convenience store or something in the middle of the night like that. It was a cold case. We weren't actively working it anymore. I left and it was hard. Um, you know, I was always thinking about Lisa Kimmel, so was Dan. And uh, thinking, you know, will we get this thing solved someday? You know, will that what right lead come up? And I remember when I left, I said, Dan, before I die, you know, call me and uh, let me know you found him. Fourteen years later, Natrona County Sheriff's investigator Lynn Cohey knows it's a long shot, but decides the Kimmel file is worth a final look. 
Cohey sends semen samples recovered from autopsy to the state crime lab. A genetic profile is extracted and downloaded into the state's DNA databank. There, it is compared against more than 2,000 felony offenders from Wyoming. A few months later, Lynn Coey's phone rings. The crime lab has a cold hit. Of course, the first question out of my mouth, who is it? And uh, Sandy Mays and Tilton Davis said, the guy's name is Dale Wayne Eaton, and he was in our penitentiary back in 98. So after I picked my jaw up off the floor, um, I started doing any and all research that I could find on Dale Eaton. Dale Eaton's DNA went into the state data bank after he was convicted on a federal firearms charge. According to prison records, he is in the middle of a five-year stretch for that offense. Cohe and fellow detective Dan Tholson decided to pay Eaton a visit at a federal prison just outside Inglewood, Colorado. On July 17, 2002, Lynn Cohey and Dan Folson sit down with Dale Wayne Eaton and ask what he knows about Lisa Kimmel. He said that he'd heard about the case on TV, said he never knew Lisa, but he did say, well, wasn't that the girl that was on her way to Montana? And on that particular time, she was not on her way to Montana. She was on her way to, to Cody, Wyoming. He denied ever knowing her, ever having any kind of contact. So he couldn't use that defense later that, you know, he had sex with her and turned her loose and somebody else killed her. But as far as specifically admitting anything, he wouldn't. And he eventually got so dry mouthed he couldn't talk anymore. Eaton's mouth gets even drier when detectives tell him about the DNA match, linking him to semen recovered from autopsy. Suddenly the convict doesn't want to talk at all. Detectives believe they have found Lisa Kimmel's killer, but still have some work to do. The DNA match establishing only that Eaton had sex with Lisa Kimmel, not that he killed her. We wanted to be able to prove the case without the DNA, which, you know, theoretically couldn't do that because you got his name from the DNA, but we wanted to be able to do it without having to rely on the DNA. Among the people they speak with, one of Eaton's neighbors in Manita, Wyoming, a woman named Doris Buckta. He was a good neighbor, but he was, a, in my opinion, what I call weird. Weird incorporates a wide range of behavior, including one day when, according to Doris, Dale Eaton started digging in his front yard. My husband asked him, he said, what are you digging, Dale? And he said, I'm digging a well. And he said, well, man, you're crazy. You can't dig a well out here, we have to go down almost 300 foot to get water. He was so weird anyway that I thought, well, he probably thinks he can dig a well. According to a journal kept by Doris, Eaton began to dig in the days just after Lisa Kimmel disappeared. That, coupled with the size of the hole described by Doris, leads detectives to wonder if Dale Eaton was not digging a well, but a grave for Lisa Kimmel's long-lost car. At 10 a.m. on July 29th, detectives descend on Dale Eaton's property, armed with a warrant to search for the black Honda Lisa Kimmel was driving on the night she disappeared 14 years earlier. Within the first few hours of searching, investigators have uncovered a variety of car parts. A backhoe reaches into the earth just eight feet down. The machine hits a gold mine. The operator dug in and, and scraped back some dirt and there was a chunk of metal sitting there and it was the top of the driver's side door. As the hole widens, detectives realize they have found not just a door, but Lisa Kimmel's entire car buried whole in Dale Eaton's front yard. Dale Wayne Eaton is charged with the murder of Lisa Kimmel on April 21st, 2003. Eaton is convicted of murder in the first degree and receives the death sentence. 